Well, tonight we're going to wrap it all up. And for those who have heard these things many times, it's always good to go over it again. And for those who are hearing it for the first time, well, let's see if we can make this thing clear. The people are waiting in the world for the culmination of all things, and the world is expecting the millennium. And there are so many millennial teachings out there that as many denominations, as many millennial teachings. Let's have a brief summary of the millennial teachings in the world out there. Well, one of the views expounded is amillennialism. In other words, there isn't a millennium. There is no specific period of a thousand-year reign. The period applies to the whole of church history. This view is the view held by Roman Catholicism and some conservative Protestant groups. So they preach there is no millennium. The church will finally rule, and that's the culmination of all of these things. There's no millennial period. But the Bible clearly speaks of a millennial period. So amillennianism is not something that you can equate with the biblical teaching. And then there is the doctrine of postmillennianism. This view claims that the kingdom is a present reality because Christ reigns in his church. All nations will be converted to Christ prior to the coming of Christ. The period prior to his coming will become peaceful and the gospel will be spread to all nations. Now, judging from last night's lecture, is this biblical? No. But both the Lutheran and the Augsburg Confession and the Puritan Westminster Confession subscribe to this view. Wow. So the mega-Protestant movements, the conservative ones, prescribe to a view that is obviously not biblical. And then you have premillennianism. And that is divided into dispensational premillennianism. That's the view of a secret rapture prior to the tribulation. The millennium kingdom reaches its fulfillment in the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation, the temple and sacrificial system are restored in Palestine. All the warnings given to the church regarding the time of trouble prior to the coming of Christ now becomes applicable only to the Jews. And that would apply then also to Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and all the teachings regarding the kingdom. So you cannot even pray the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, because the kingdom concerns the Jews, doesn't even concern the Christian. So why bother praying that prayer, right? So this is rather confusing. Last night we went through the secret rapture. Was there a secret rapture? No. no. There's only a mega coming of Christ, and everything happens then. So large portions of the evangelical world subscribe to this worldview, but it's not biblical. And then you have historic premillennialism. That's the redeemed of all ages on the earth during the millennium. But the Bible clearly says there is nobody on the earth during the millennium. And all the peoples of God uh, the church is the Israel of God, comprising all the peoples of God. The millennial period constitutes the first thousand years of God's kingdom on the earth. And thereafter, there are all kinds of other turmoils happening, and some evangelical gr groups prescribe uh, to this view. So those are the main views on the millennium that are being preached in the various churches out there, and they're as far removed from each other as the east is from the west. Isn't that right? This is utterly confusing. Which one should one ascribe to? So let's briefly go through this once again. Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, and I will be like the Most High. So Satan aspired to be like God. And he developed eye problems. And if you use the King James Version of the Bible, then it being a direct translation, will give you a very direct form of the original writings in Hebrew. 
How art thou fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground and didst lay low the nations? And thou saidst in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of congregation in the uttermost parts of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Six times he develops this I problem. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, says 2 Corinthians 11.14. And the Bible warns us to be sober and to be vigilant because the devil is roaming around like a roaring lion. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, because Satan had been thrown out of heaven. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. So, this is a period on this earth in which probation lasts. And then at the second coming, probation has closed. Let him who is filthy remain filthy. Let him who is righteous become more righteous. Revelation, central theme is, Behold, he comes with a cloud and every eye shall see him. That's what the Bible's culmination is. And we saw that it's going to be a mega visible coming, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will also be the coming of the Son of Man. And he will come in the glory of his Father, we saw, and in the glory of all the angels with him, and in the, his own glory. And he will recompense every man according to his works. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. And then we saw that there would be a first resurrection and a second resurrection. I'm just recapping a little bit. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. And we saw that between these two resurrections, how much time? A thousand years. So we have a resurrection of life. We have a resurrection of damnation, and we dealt with the resurrection of life last night. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 So the first resurrection is for the righteous. And they have been looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there you have that Kai construction, which means that the great God and Savior and Jesus Christ are one and the same. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. And then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. Most of the texts in the Bible deal with the second coming of Christ, the deliverance of his people. And it is important that we separate them carefully. You will remember the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ are the first ones to rise. And those that are alive, if we looked at those texts, but the coming of the Lord will be transformed instantly. And they put on immortality, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, and 53. And then we are caught up together with them in the clouds, the resurrected righteous, together with the translated living, meet the Lord in the air, and the clouds we saw were the angels that take us away from the earth. So there is a rapture, but there is a mega rapture, and the righteous go to heaven. We also looked at what will happen to the wicked, for the great day of wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation 16, 7. They hid themselves in the dens. They say, rocks fall on us, mountains fall on us, and they are destroyed by the brightness of the Lord's coming and from the wrath of the land. Revelation 6, 15. And the Lord will destroy on that day the nations, the kings, and the planet will be destroyed and he will execute the heads of many countries, and he will fill the place with dead bodies. Now that sounds terrible, and this is an unusual work. And God has long tolerated rebellion 
against his rule. And this is the culmination of this activity. And he answers the six with his eight, which is the number of Christ. And I shall come, it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that I, now comes retribution, will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, so your military will not help you. I will destroy thy chariots, chariots, no military power will stand against him. I will cut off the cities of thy land, throw down all thy strongholds. I will cut off witchcraft out of thine hands, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images also will I cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands. And I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee. So some of the groves are really going to go, even in California, right? Watch out. So I will destroy thy cities, and I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. Micah 5, 10 to 15. So this is the eighth answer to the six. There's going to be a day of recompense and retribution. So the wicked are slain. And these wicked will remain slain for a thousand years. And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So is there a thousand year period? Yes or no? Yes. So there's not an amillennialism like Roman Catholicism and the Augsburg Confession says. There is a period of a thousand years. And the devil is bound in chains. Now do you think these chains are literal chains? No. No. I believe he's bound in chains of circumstance for a thousand years. Psalm 68, 6 says, God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out that which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. So God is in the, in the habit of releasing people from the chains of bondage to sin. This is a, a symbol and Satan is bound by chains of circumstances. Why? Because there's no one to deceive. Everybody is dead. And the righteous, they're gone. So for a milli anos, for a thousand years, he is bound. And the state of the planet during that period, I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger, Jeremiah 4.26. Does any of the millennial teachings out there in the world represent that text, yes or no? No, not one of them. So, simply put, not one of them are biblical. So they cannot be true. Desolate cities is what the Bible says will exist on the planet. And the slain of the Lord, says Jeremiah, shall be at that time from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Jeremiah 25, 33. No one to pick them up. No one to bury them. They will be dung on the ground. And those that are still under the ground that have not been resurrected, they remain there together with the slain at the second coming. Everybody is dead, except Satan and his angels. So at the second coming, the Bible says Jesus returns. The righteous living ascend and meet the Lord in the air. The righteous dead, of course, undergo this resurrection, and the wicked living is slain. Is that biblical? Yes. That's the biblical story. Now the rest of the dead, those that were wicked and were dead, when Christ returned, they lived not again until the thousand years were finished, Revelation 25. So, for a thousand years, this is a planet of death. After all, Satan is the god of the dead, so he's welcome to all the dead. He gets them for a thousand years. So, between the first resurrection and the second resurrection, the Bible says there are one thousand years, and it is a millennium of death and the earth is destroyed. It is abusos. 
it is without form and it is void. It goes back to that primordial state. There is nothing here that is alive. The animals, everything is destroyed. Everything is dead. And Satan can look on the dead bodies and see what he can do as Anubis, the god of mummification. He has nothing to keep him busy. Now what do the righteous do during that millennium? Does the Bible give us any details? Yes. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 26. So the righteous go to heaven. There will be silence in heaven for half an hour. Some people say, if you use the day year principle, that's a week. That takes the Lord a week to get here. Uh, we would be in serious trouble if it took him a week to get here. But uh, how long did it take the angel to respond to Daniel's prayer? While he was still in prayer, he was still thinking about it, and there it was. So there's no problem getting here on time, so why the long trip back through the celestial heavens? Perhaps we're going on a tour of the universe. And you know what? I'd rather be that astronaut than one in a funny suit. <laughs> but when they get to heaven, they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 26. And I saw thrones and they, sat upon them, they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. Revelation 24. Now when Christ returns, he must have already judged everyone because the wicked are severed from the just. Isn't that correct? So the judgment has taken place already. So what judgment is taking place here in heaven? I call this the judgment of verification. Jesus is going to hand over the books so that we can see that all his judgments are fair. This is the type of God we serve. You can go and check out the record, he says. See for yourself. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we will judge angels? 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3. In other words, we get an insight into the whole plan of salvation and the record of the fall right from what happened in heaven all the way through to the final rebellion. I will not serve who is the Lord that I should serve him. I know not the Lord. So all the way through we get to see that record. What a fascinating view that will be as to what did what and to whom. And then something else that is interesting. We judge now with our human eye. But Christ reads the what? The heart. So I come to heaven and I say, excuse me, Lord, but where is Aunt Magdalene? She was such a sweetie pie, and I, I don't see her. Ah, what is that guy doing here? <laughs> can you see the picture? And we can see that the Lord was absolutely righteous in all his judgments. And all the questions are being answered. We'll look into the character of the angel of rebellion. And the judgment reveals that God has done everything he can to save every single individual. He has leaned over backwards. Even so, Lord or God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Revelation 16, 7. So those that have the privilege of going through the record of history and seeing every secret thing that has been done behind closed doors, will eventually, after a thousand years of study, because that's how long it's going to take, say that the Lord was absolutely righteous. But then, there will have to come a day of reckoning when those who have rebelled against God and have slaughtered his saints throughout the ages, will have to admit before the entire universe that they were in error and in rebellion. 
So, during the millennium, the righteous are in heaven, the earth is desolate, Satan is bound by chains of circumstances, and the judgment of verification takes place in heaven, and we can see, because God is an open book, that everything he did was just and fair and righteous. Now remember we said the Bible speaks about four comings of Christ, and you will remember it was as a babe, first coming, to the ancient of days. This was an event that we haven't discussed yet that took place in the book of Daniel. It's a judgment scene, and then we have the coming in glory, the second coming, and then there is a coming to this earth to restore the earth and set up the kingdom. So our eternal home will not be heaven where it is now, but will be down here on this earth. Remember the text, the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished, so there must be a resurrection. Who is the author of life? Christ. Who can give them life? Christ. No one else. So he has to come down to this earth and call forth the dead. Now the book of Revelation is written as a chiasm. It has a chiastic structure, which means it's written like this. And you have a historic arm and you have a eschatological arm giving the future. So when you're reading in the second half, everything is written in reverse, pointing to the climax in the middle. So it's complicated because some of the events seem to be back to front. But if we keep that in mind, the structure then it's not too difficult to unravel the book of Revelation. So what happens at the end of the thousand years? Now when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. How is he loosened out of his prison? By the second resurrection. And shall go out to deceive the nations. Revelation 27, 8. Which nations is he going to deceive? Those that are resurrected. So here they all are again. And he sees the Adolf Hitlers and the Napoleons and the mega rulers and the Neros and he sees them with their military power and their military might and he says, I can do it. I can do it. I'm not going to give up the battle. That's the resurrection of damnation. And it's a mighty event. Now if we read the book of Zechariah, in verse, chapter 14, verse 3 and 4, we read, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. So here's another war. As when he fought in the day of battle. So what does this tell us? He will go and fight against those nations as he fought in the day of battle. Which battle did he fight before? Arma, Geren. When was that? At the second coming, right? Now there's another battle against the nations. This is not Armageddon. Notice what will happen. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and towards the west, and there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove towards the north and half of it towards the south. Is this the same as the second coming? No. What happened at the second coming? He didn't touch the earth. He stayed in the air. And everybody was taken up. So now the Lord comes down. And when his feet touch the earth, it is cleansed. Because righteousness and unrighteousness cannot exist next to each other. And a great plain is cleared up. And then he calls forth the dead. Now the events are written in reverse over here because of the chiastic structure pointing back to the climax in the middle, which is Revelation 12, 13, 14. Now what happens when this plain is created? Revelation 21, 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, which had been the home of the saints in heaven, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
This is the ultimate inauguration, the climax of history. So down comes this mega spaceship. A whole city. Wow. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now there's a whole theology out there in the millennial religions that we have out there in the world, which are looking to Jerusalem for the culmination of all things. Isn't that right? Yes. Now what's going to happen, according to the Bible, to the Jerusalem that is now over there? It's going to be destroyed. Because the word all is all-encompassing, isn't it? And that city is not going to be the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is a city that was built by God. And where's it going to come from? It's going to come down out of heaven and settle in a cleansed plain. So that is a false theology. To look over there is not looking for the solution of the promise. A Jew today has to be saved just like everyone else by the blood of the Lamb. His heritage from Abraham is not going to save him today. So that millennium system is not biblical, no matter how many people preach it. Abraham was not waiting for an earthly city. He was waiting for a heavenly city that God had constructed that would come down from heaven. So what happens here in the millennium? Jesus returns, and the first resurrection takes place. The earth is desolate, Satan is bound, and then the holy city descends after Christ, touches the earth, and cleanses it. And a second resurrection takes place. Revelation 27 talks about the second battle now. The first battle culminated in the destruction of the wicked. That was Armageddon. Now there's going to be a second conflict. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison by the resurrection. He shall go out to deceive, deceive the nations, the resurrected peoples, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. So here we have another battle, a battle of Gog and Magog. The first one was Armageddon to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, all the wicked, resurrected at the same time, right the way down from the time of Cain to the end of the world. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. Where are they? In the new Jerusalem that was built by God. And the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Oh boy, here we have a hell. Unless there is another solution. So Christ, the judge, judges them and then destroys them. So here we have this little synoptic story. And we have to get the sequence right. Revelation 20, 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. So here is the judgment scene, Christ on his throne. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Can you notice that the things are reversed over here? The resurrection takes place only down here, but there they're already standing around the throne. So you're actually reading the events backwards because of the chiastic structure. And then it makes perfect sense. The sentence reads sequentially, but the events you must reverse. 
And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So everyone has to give an account. They have to look into the one's eyes whom they defied and mocked. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now that's a definition that we have there. So the lake of fire consumes death and hell. What does this word hell mean? What does this word tell us? We'll have to go into the details. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, which is what? The second death. Isaiah 45, 22 tells us why they have to be resurrected. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. God does not want anyone to be lost. I have sworn by myself the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, whether rebellious or not. Every tongue shall swear, surely shall one say in the Lord, have I righteousness and strength, even to him shall men come. And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. There will come a day of retribution. Romans says the same thing, for it is written as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. That day is not going to escape anyone. That the wicked is reserved for the day of de destruction. They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. Job 21.30 So they will be raised in order to be destroyed in the battle of Gog and Magog. So let's have a look at this battle of Gog and Magog. What does it mean? Gog and Magog means concealed, hidden, mystery. Didn't Babylon have a mystery religion with which it deceived everyone? So here is concealment and secrets and lies and all of these issues. And they will be wiped out. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and they compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. So he surrounds them. And he thinks he has a chance to maybe take them. After all, he's got all of these brilliant minds with him. Revelation 29. And Satan says, let's take the city. But after the judgment and after every knee bows, fire came down from out of heaven and devoured them. Revelation 22, 9. What does the word devour mean? <laughs> Burn up. Burn up. So fire consumes them utterly. How utterly? What did we say yesterday? We argue from the known to the unknown. From the plain, simple to the complex. Let's look at the, comp the simple text. Psalms 37, 20 tells us, Into smoke they shall consume away. Gone. Psalms 21, 9, The fire shall devour them. Gone. And the definition of that, Revelation 20, 14, This is the second death. They die a second time. So they die the first time, they are resurrected, they have a judgment, they die a second time. By the way, that judgment also answers maybe some lingering question. Lord, if I could only have reached that person, I know that they are good, that they don't really hate you, and they will be wonderful if they can just have had the opportunity. But when they rise there, and the hatred for Christ comes out, all doubt will disappear. Another reason why they have to be resurrected. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, the nefesh, the combination of ruach and dust. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Greek, hyena. Matthew 10, 28. Now what does this word mean? Well, let's look it up. Hell is the place of the future punishment called Hiena, 
or Hyena of Fire. This was originally the Valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem, where the filth and the dead animals of the city were cast out and burned. The fit symbol of the wicked and their future, what? Destruction. So Hyena is the fire that consumes until everything is burnt up. And what does the word Hades mean? Hades, or the Hebrew shoal, refers to the place of the dead or the grave. So this is not a place where the living entities live. The word shoal appears 65 times in the Hebrew Bible. Now the King James translates the word 30 times as hell, and 30 times as grave, and 3 times as pit. Isn't that strange? So when it says hell, it could just as well say what? Grave. Grave. And vice versa. Or pit. Place of burial. The Greek words that are often translated as hell are the words Hades, Hiena, and Taratu. Hades was the Greek god of the underworld and also the underworld itself. The Septuagint, the oldest Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses the word Hades to translate the Hebrew word Shoal. And so we have all this confusion in the Bible of all these terms which really can be rendered quite simply. So where did Christ go when he descended into hell? Where did he go? The to the grave. Acts 2.31, he seeing this before spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, hard death, neither his flesh did see corruption. Simply put, Christ went to the grave, and he was resurrected before all of these things come into play, like decomposition and the rest. Now you remember this little video on authority and tradition, where the Jesuits uh, and the Catholics explain their very doctrine. Notice what they say, and remember that the Catholic creed, which has take, been taken over by most Protestants virtually unchanged, says he descended into hell. Do you remember that? Good. In 1545, Catholic leaders traveled to the city of Trent at the foot of the Alps in northern Italy. Over a period of 18 years, the Council of Trent grappled with some of the most critical issues the Roman Catholic Church had ever faced. The first real substantial issue that the Council dealt with was what we might call the issue of authority, that is to say, the role of scripture and then the role of church traditions. The Council of Trent resolved that the authority of the church rested on twin pillars, not on scripture alone, but on scripture and something that the Council called tradition, the ongoing authority that descended the faith that came from the apostles, that acted as a, a, a twin pillar alongside scripture to sustain the teaching authority of the Catholic Church. The decree of Trent on uh, this issue of authority begins by saying that the faith of the church and practice of the church is based upon the teaching and preaching of Christ and the apostles as this has come down to us in two ways in the written tradition, that is say in the written scriptures and then in the unwritten traditions that go back to the time of the apostles. The Catholic understanding was that, that Christ himself established the structure of the church, focused on the bishops, so that uh, when bishops uh, faced a dispute over the interpretation of scripture, they couldn't just make up their minds as they pleased, but they had to take into account the decisions of preceding centuries of bishops and councils deciding questions. That was the tradition. So the tradition then becomes a lens through which uh, the bishops decide uh, an interpretation of scripture. Here was a fundamental position that still separates the Church of Rome from most of the Protestant world. By confirming the authority of unwritten tradition, the bishops at the council validated many non-biblical teachings and customs. In this decree, the council does not list any of them, but we know from the discussions that issues that uh, were on, their, on the minds of the bishops were, for instance, uh, infant baptism. Where do you find that in the Bible? And yet that's a, an established Christian practice. The teaching of the creed that Christ descended into hell, 
Not so clear where we can find that in the New Testament. What about uh, Sunday observance? Uh, that doesn't seem to be in the New Testament. What about... So the Jesuits agree that the teaching that Christ descended into, the, into hell is not really in the New Testament. They know this. But it is a common teaching. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. So God doesn't really want that any man should be lost. But Satan is lost. But if you choose to follow Satan, then you will also be in this everlasting fire. And we have to understand what the everlasting fire means. This is how the Roman Catholics interpret the everlasting fire. The works of Samuel Hopkins say, The smoke of their torment shall ascend up forever in sight of the blessed. Before their eyes, this display of divine character and glory will be in favor of the redeemed and most entertaining and give the highest pleasure to those who love God. Should the eternal torment and fires be extinguished, it would be in great measure put an end to the happiness and glory of the blessed. <laughs> now you might be laughing, but this is the Calvinist creed as well. This is precisely the Articles of Dort, which is Calvinism. So this doctrine is pernicious. And this is what made me an atheist. Because remember, I was told that my mother would what, burn in hell for all eternity. And I was not going to be reconciled to a God like that. And if I should be in heaven one day, or my son and my daughter or my grandchild would not be there, and they were frying in hell for all eternity, I would not want to be in heaven because I would not be able to stand it. Amen. So... Where does this doctrine come from and how are we to explain it? There are some difficult texts here. Ezekiel 33, 11. As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? It doesn't say, why would you be tormented forever and ever, O house of Israel? Why would you die? I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, Ezekiel 18, 32. I'm always stunned when the minister says, it pleased God to take our dearly beloved brother away from us today. It doesn't please God at all. He has no pleasure in the death of anyone that dieth. So the Council of Trent decided in purgatory the souls can themselves wipe out their debts only by suffering. So this whole doctrine of suffering and torment in hell is a Roman Catholic doctrine which even the Jesuits themselves admit is not biblical. And this is the artist's impressions as they come down through the ages in Dr. Faustus and all the great plays written by the great Freemasons like... Uh, Mozart, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, 33 degree Freemason, the blessed and the cursed. Psalms 92 verse 7 says plainly, When the wicked spring as the grass and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. So the everlasting fire, is it the fire that lasts forever or is it the destruction that lasts forever? In the Hebrew mindset, the fire is everlasting. It burns until there is nothing left to burn. And the consequences of the burning are everlasting. You cannot get it back. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion and the stream thereof shall be turned into pitch and the dust thereof into brimstone and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched, night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever from generation to generation. Shall it lay waste, none pass through it forever and ever. Isaiah 34, 8 to 10. All right, now it looks again as though the fire burns forever. Job 21, 30, that the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. That's not forever and ever. The consequences are forever and ever. 
Now, this is interesting. This is the Afrikaans Bible, so I'm not going to deal with it. But this is the old translation where it clearly says that they will be destroyed. And the new translation is thunderously stunning. Let me translate that for you. Perhaps you should hear the language of heaven, though, for a while. Hulle sê, slechte man wat op die dag van onheil gered, hy word op die dag van toorn verskoon. Wow. That translation now says, where it before says, that he will be brought forth for destruction, says that the wicked man will be brought forth on this day and that he will be spared on that day and forgiven. That is the new theology creeping right there into the new translation. It's so disgusting, I will skip it. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Is it the punishment or the consequences that are eternal? Let's go into this. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Revelation 14, 11. So if you read these complicated verses, some seem to indicate, yes, the fire burns forever, and some seem to indicate the consequences are forever. So how do we resolve the issue? The Bible has to resolve it. And the Bible does it by means of parallelism. In Jeremiah, you will find the unquenchable fire. But if you will not hearken unto me and hallow the Sabbath day and not bear a burden, interesting how he uses these words, right? That the Sabbath is right there in it again. Entering in at the gates of Jerusalem the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Here is a prophecy that fire will destroy Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar comes and destroys it, and the fire cannot be quenched. It is an unquenchable fire. Well, if you go to Jerusalem today, are those fires still burning? No. Now, in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, and it tells you about Nebuchadnezzar who is coming, Babylon into Jerusalem, and they burnt the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, and all the houses of the great men burned with fire. Jeremiah 52, 12 to 13. And they burnt the house of God and they broke down the walls of Jerusalem, etc. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, 2 Chronicles 36, 19, 21. So Hebrew parallelism tells us that the unquenchable fire was fulfilled when Jerusalem was destroyed, but the fire wasn't unquenchable in the sense that it burnt forever. It did its job until it had completed it. So the consequences are eternal. That puts it beyond doubt. So let's ask the Bible, how long do the wicked burn? Psalms 37, 20, the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. They shall consume away. So there is a total destruction. Fire came down from heaven from God and devoured them, Revelation 29. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven and all the proud, yea, and all the do wicked shall be stubble on the day that cometh shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch, Malachi 4.1. They're going to be gone. So there is no eternally burning hell fire. It doesn't exist. And just to make doubly sure, the Bible gives us another example of this fire. In 2 Peter 2, 6, we hear about Sodom and Gomorrah that will be destroyed and burnt to ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that should live ungodly. So when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, it was an example. Jude takes it further and says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So the city suffers the consequences 
of an unquenchable fire, the consequences of which are eternal. The cities aren't burning anymore. They shall be as though they had not been. Abadiah 16, that puts it beyond doubt. So what happens to the wicked after the final judgment? They're destroyed by fire. They suffer the second death, which is the lake of fire. It burns them up until they are as though they had not been. And you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day in which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi 4.3 They will be gone. And death and hell, the grave, as well as death, disappear in the lake of fire. There will be no more graves. There will be no more dead people. This is the second death, and whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. They suffered the consequences of the second death. You will say to me, excuse me, what about the rich man and Lazarus? Don't we have a problem here? Don't we have a problem? But when Paul perceived that one part of the Sadducees and the other was Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee of the hope and resurrection of the dead, and I'm called in question. You see, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, the Sadducees believed like Christians believe today. Alexandrian education, fascinating. The Sadducees received their education from Alexandria, and they had the pagan view that when you died, your spirit went either to hell or to heaven. But the Pharisees believed what the Bible said, so they believed the biblical view. And Paul says, I'm a Pharisee! And he knew that he was going to put the cat amongst the pigeons with that. <laughs> and when he had said so, there arose dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisee confesses them both. So here was this doctrine, the same doctrine that we have today in the world in the time of Paul. And the same argument was there. And when Jesus was confronted with Sadducees, he was confronted with their doctrine as well. And he confronted it head on. Acts 4, 1 to 3, And as they spoke unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through, through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Let me tell you something today. The Sadducees in the world out there will be very grieved at the sermon that is being preached here tonight. Because it's contrary to everything that they believe, isn't it so? Same then. And they laid hands on them and put them in on hold into the next day and it was now even tied. So they whisked them off. They arrested them. Acts 4, 1 to 3. You're not allowed to preach that there is a death and a resurrection and that the consequences of death are eternal because it touches our immortality and our deity. How dare we? Well, let's look at this parable. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now, whose theology was that? Pharisee or Sadducee theology? That was Sadducee theology. Because this is what happened. If you were of Abraham's seed, you went straight to Abraham's bosom. And there you sat. In heaven, in your reclined luxury forever and ever. We have the same theologies today. You go to heaven. If you're a Muslim, you go to seventh heaven. If you're a Mormon, well, you get all these beautiful celestial beings to entertain you while you are there. Same type of theology in the world today. And uh, Lazarus represents whom? Lazarus represents none other 
than those who were excluded from the rich man's table. Who was rich in knowledge of salvation? The Jews. Salvation was from the Jews. And here were all these heathens and they were excluded. And in fact, they were called dogs. So Lazarus represents those outside the faith of Abraham, which were laid at his gate full of sores, covered with the consequences of sin, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from Israel's table. Just a little bit. But they were so proud that they were being saved by their heritage. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, according to their theology, where was Lazarus going to go? He was going to go straight to hell because he wasn't from Abraham's seed. And the rich guy, where was he going to go, according to the Sadducean doctrine? To Abraham's lap. And now Jesus comes and he twists their theology. He turns it upside down. Then it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Their eyes went like this. What? The rich man also died and was buried. You see, they taught that if you were rich, you were blessed by God. If you were poor, you were under curse. God didn't care about you. That's why you were poor. So he turns their theology upside down. And in hell, lifted up his eyes. Who had the doctrine of hell and heaven? The Sadducees. Being in torment and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Excuse me. You shall worship the Lord thy God and him only shall you serve. You shall call no one father except thy father in heaven. Who practiced ancestor worship? The Sadducees. Their heritage to Abraham was more important than anything else. It was their key to salvation. And here they are praying to Abraham rather than to God. Now is this biblical, yes or no? Of course not. So this is what? This is an allegory. Jesus is telling a story. It's not even a parable, strictly speaking. He's taking their theology and showing them how ridiculous it is by twisting everything around. Afar off, and Lazarus is his Buddhism, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the ting, tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. So he turns their doctrine totally upside down. And besides all this, between us and there is a great gulf fixed, and they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. That was a doctrine. You will find it in all the doctrines today, the same thing, a great gulf fixed. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. This is blasphemy. You don't pray to the deceased. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. What's he referring them to? The Bible. Go and read your Bibles, he says to them. Now listen to this. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If you hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, through though one rise from the dead. By the way, did a Lazarus rise from the dead? Yes. yes. Were they persuaded by his testimony? No. In fact, they sought to kill him. This is used as a theology of hell. Decisions regarding eternal life must be made in this world. There is no second chance after death. It has been given for man once to die, thereafter the judgment. Second chance gospel. I just showed it to you in the Afrikaans translation. What a miserable translation that new translation is. Suddenly there's a second chance gospel. There's Sadducees. 
The rich man's prayer was directed to Abraham instead to God. He trusted in the fact that he was a descendant of Abraham, rather in his relationship with God. However, between him and Abraham, there was a great gulf flicks. In contrast, the thief on the cross showed genuine remorse, repentance, and was justified and comforted. As Lazarus did not come back from the dead and testified that Jesus was the resurrection and the life, but the Jews did not believe him and even tried to kill him and silence his testimony. So, this story is not a support of the doctrine of hell. On the contrary, it is a condemnation of that doctrine. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. 2 Peter 2.9 Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. 2 Thessalonians 1.9 The punishment is obliteration. So how many chances do I have to be right with God? One. When must I make that decision? Now. And this is very serious. The doctrines out there, even of an eternal hell and an eternal immortality in hell, give comfort to those who want to remain in transgression. How many people have you heard joking, oh, we'll play cards down there, or we'll do this, or we'll do that? This is a doctrine which is pernicious and pertains to second chance theology. What happens to Satan? I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of them that behold thee, and never shalt thou be any more. It cannot be plainer. Ezekiel 28, 16, 18, 19. Not even the devil is going to burn eternally. He's going to disappear. There will be no reminder of sin and tears in the new world. It will be gone. It will be gone forever. And the earth also and the works which are therein shall be burnt up. 2 Peter 3.10 this atmosphere which is polluted, this planet that is full of junk, will burn up. Say unto them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Ezekiel 33, for I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, says the Lord. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live. That decision must be made today. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah 55 verse 7. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering towards us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is a God who is worth serving. He's kind, he's gentle, he's long-suffering, but there comes a point when rebellion must be stopped because the continuation will mean everlasting misery. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear the voice and shall come forth those that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation, says John 5, 28, 29, and they will be gone. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God, and they shall see his face. So God is going to move the seat of heaven to this planet. This will become the new heaven, the center of the universe. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, Revelation 21.1. Peter says the same, Nevertheless, according to this promise, we look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. There is no more wickedness. So after the millennium, God will recreate the world. I wonder how he's going to do it, and in how many days. And whether he will say, come with me, and he will say, 
Let there be. And we will see it coming forth from the Creator's hand. Not even Adam and Eve had that privilege. Did you know that? And we will have that privilege. What an amazing thing. So at the end of the millennium, the holy city descends, Satan attacks, the wicked are destroyed, and the earth is made new. That's the biblical teaching. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were gone, passed away. And there was no more sea. This could refer to separation of the nations. It could also mean the ocean as we know it, separating the peoples. And what will this new world be like? Mind-bogglingly beautiful. If God has left so many reminders today of what it must have been like, I cannot even imagine what it's going to be like. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Isaiah 11, 6, 9. The animal kingdom will be vegetarian. Nobody will come and eat up your little lamb. It'll be absolutely safe in your garden. And God recreates everything beautifully. And I want to tell, to tell the young people, if you have an interest in exploration, this will be a never-ending exploration. We will go and see things like you cannot believe. We'll take maybe a dinosaur ride. Because lizards are cute. Did you know that? They're only depicted as ugly. Who said they were as mean as they say? They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. So you will have your loved ones around you, Isaiah 65, 23. You know, I always joked I didn't want to go to heaven because I hate sitting around on clouds. It's boring. I like to do things. And then I'm not m musical in terms of playing an instrument. My wife would love getting a harp. She'd do a nut. But as for me, man, leave me alone. Give me a hammer, not a harp. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Is God going to brainwash us? No, but the beauty of the world and time will take away the pain. And God will wipe away all tears, and over time it will fade. But there will be reminders in his hands and in his feet, and we will say, Lord, look at that, look what you did for me. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another eat. Mine elect shall long enjoy the works of their hands, Isaiah 65. What a fantastic promise. So the Lord says, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you and... I will come again so that you can be where I am also. First resurrection. Everybody goes up. They go to the holy city. Is there a house prepared for you? Yes, yes you have a house, a mansion. You will walk in there in the streets of gold. You will feel as though you are absolutely welcome. And you will go into your home and you will have your own home built by whom? God, especially according to your likes and less dislikes. But me, I also like doing things myself. I will look at this house and I'll say, wow, this is great, this is cool, this is wonderful. Uh, uh, but I would like to do this or that or the other. When I get to earth, God will say, here's a piece of land for you, a farm, a place in the country. The holy city Jerusalem descends. I have a city dwelling, but I'm not going to live there on a permanent basis. I get a country dwelling. And the Lord says, here's your hammer. I say, wow, great. I get to build my own house. Maybe I'll ask you to help me, Vansel. He's a good builder. But maybe not. I'd rather struggle myself. Build your own house. And I'll build my own house, and I'll build it, and I will dwell in it, and not another. 
you know, I've modified at least 13 houses and moved at least 20 times. And every time I plant trees, and I never get to eat them. And I drive past all these old houses where I stayed, and there are these huge trees full of fruit, and if I take one, I'm stealing. It's disgusting. No longer will I build and others inhabit them. No longer will I plant and others have the sole benefit thereof. You're welcome to come and eat my avocados. They will be the best. Sorry. But they're mine. So you will long enjoy the works of your hands. That's for eternity. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, says the Lord. So you're not a ghost. And you know something fascinating? The Bible says they follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. Doesn't it say that? Now who is he, the Lamb? He's the king of the universe. Now where does the king of the universe go? Throughout the universe. Wow. Do you mean I get to go along as an ambassador? And we follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth and we go to planet Zeta. And there are created beings and we tell them about the plan of salvation, the love of God, and we inoculate them with our knowledge against sin and rebellion forever and ever and ever. Does that make sense? So you have an ambassadorial role. You get to represent Jesus Christ in the universe. You have your own country dwelling. You have your city dwelling. And we get to go with the King of Kings wherever he goes. And we will be close to his side because we have been bought with a price. Did you know something? That when you restore something, it gets more value than the original. You know that, right? So that which is restored out of this catastrophe called sin will have more value than it ever had before. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down in the kingdom of heaven. I cannot wait for the kingdom of heaven. It is so real and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. Isaiah 66, 23. Some people say you shouldn't use this text because it's typological and... Uh, Part of it has been filled in type and part not. No, I want to use the whole text. One new moon to another means there will be a monthly festival, right or wrong? Right. And from one Sabbath to another will all flesh come to worship before me. The Sabbath is the day that has been made for man. We have many duties to fulfill in that new kingdom, but on Sabbath we get to rest with God. Can you imagine the heavenly choir? Can you imagine being part of it and singing with angels? Chilling. Chilling. What are we going to do once a month? You're right. And the tree of life bore its fruit once a month. Twelve kinds of fruits and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. Now why do we need healing? There's probably an element in it so that we constantly are reminded of our dependence upon God that keeps our DNA perfect. Just like some plants today have antioxidants and all of these issues. I don't know, maybe the leaves taste like the best carob you've ever eaten. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe you're making a tea of it, I don't know. And there are 12 fruits to choose from, whichever one you like. But we have a Tree of Life festival once a month and we have a Sabbath once a week. And we will be with the Lord forever and ever and ever and there will be no such thing as boredom. There will be no such thing as pain. 